Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Up now, we have Imagination Connected, bringing the creative toys to the metaverse. Our speaker is David Kleeman. David? Thank you very much. Well, glad to uh, be back at Toy Fair. Thank you very much to the Toy Association for inviting me to, uh, to speak to you today. Day two of Toy Fair, and I've already impressed my grandchildren by getting my picture taken with the Paw Patrol pups and Clifford the Big Red Dog. So, uh, good start to the day. I, when I titled this speech, uh, Bringing Creative Toys to the Metaverse, uh, it was several months ago, and in some ways we've stopped using the term metaverse, or we've, we've, we're using it less now. The metaverse is here, it's just in pieces, and we have to assemble it. And I think you'll see through my presentation that a lot of the individual components that describe this world where you can do many things that you want, where there are connected worlds, where you can have more control over your experience are all there. We're just having to assemble them. I should say, by the way, I'm going to be presenting data throughout. Um, it comes from our Dubbit Trends study, trend study every six months. We're in the US and the UK studying a deep dive into kids' use of uh, device, what devices they have, what they have access to, how they use them, when they use them, where they use them, who they use them with, the content they prefer, how they find their way to that content in a very busy uh, media environment, and uh, many other things about, about their media experience. We measure 2 to 18 year olds in the US and UK, 2 to 15 in, uh, in the 18 other countries that we visit. It's hard to read data slides often or to keep up with data slides, so please if, you know, feel free to take pictures of it, but even better, if you want to come see me afterwards and give me a business card, I'm happy to share these slides with you. So we have to start with a basic question, and I've even heard it expressed here uh, around the Toy Fair floor recently. Is there a difference still between play and digital play? Or have we just come to an era where whatever the kids are playing with, it's play? When I first came to Toy Fair, probably more than 10 years ago, there was, I'm taking some liberties with the layout of Toy Fair here, but there was a tiny little section way back in the back of the bottom floor called Tech Toys. And everything that had a chip, a battery, anything like that, went over to the Tech Toys all the way at the end. But when you stop and think about it, how do families buy toys? They don't walk into the store and say, I'm looking for a tech toy. They walk in and they say, I'm looking for a creative toy. I'm looking for a building toy. I'm looking for an art toy. I'm looking for what it is that drives my, my child, that really sparks their imagination and their interest. So now if you look at the toy fair floor, I think we've realized that this is not a distinction that we can easily make. And so you've got some tech enabled toys in all these same different categories of toys. You wander the floor, you will see things with absolutely no technology built in right next to things that are really, you know, that are incorporating AI, that are uh, using uh, virtual reality in that. I'm going to close that, that loop of uh, whether there's a difference between play and digital play with two people who probably have never appeared on the same slide before. Uh, Jean Piaget and Jeff Bezos. Uh, Piaget said child development doesn't change. It's the context that changes. So kids have the same drivers, the same needs, the same uh, developmental stages as they always have had, but the context in which they go through that process changes around them. Then, if you look at Bezos, he says people often ask me, what's gonna change in the next 10 years. They almost never ask me what's not gonna change. And for him, that's the much more important question because there are things that are essential to, to, uh, to, child, to, to consumers' lives that don't change. And if you go to those very basic instincts, those very basic drivers, then you don't get caught up in the momentary uh, changes of, of, of trying to chase trends. When I go to our Dubbit Trends, data and I start looking at what toys kids play with weekly and daily. Weekly you can see art and creativity toys are the number one choice, but very close behind it, if you look down in that, four, that, that uh, fourth line, children's electronics. 
So when they what they choose to play with on a weekly basis, construction and building toys, creative toys, toys that support learning, obviously that's going to be also, a, you know, it, almost everything supports learning when you come right down to the basics of it. And, and parents will often choose things that they feel will support their children's learning. But this is what what they choose to play with, or what they, use, what they play with on a weekly basis. Daily looks very much the same. Art and creativity toys have slipped to number two, but just barely. And it's electronics right up there as well, learning support, construction, and building toys again. When we turn the question around and ask kids what it is that they look for in a, when they're choosing a toy or a game, that's when you get you know, fun is the table stakes. If it's not fun, they're not going to play with it. They're not going to choose it. So fun is the table stakes. But it helps me to be creative. I can use my imagination. It involves construction. All of these are the creative things that we can also import into digital, digital tools to engage in, different, in those forms of play. Again, this one's probably a little hard to read from a distance, but when we ask them with games, when we switch over in, in, from toys to games and ask what it is that they like about the games that they play, and by games I'm th look, thinking about electronics here, I'm thinking about video games, I'm thinking about the online social games, it's exciting. Again, that's probably table stakes. If, if, uh, if it's not exciting, they're probably not going to engage with it for very long. But it's, I can be creative with it that comes in in the second place there. I can share with others, I can engage with others while I'm doing it, I can play with friends. Those are the top things that they care about when they choose the games that they play. And if you look at what we call the big three of games, Roblox, Fortnite, Minecraft, those are the ones that have kids' attention for the most time right now. If you look at those, it's the creative side of it, it's the building side of it, that is engaging them. Why do they play? They want to build things. They want to build or construct things. They want to create things within the game. They want to you know, create new, new outfits for their avatars. They want to design and customize. They've, they have themselves built something within the platform, built a game that they've shared with others, and they can make up their own stories. All of these are the classic play patterns that they have been doing with physical toys for generations, for forever. They've been creating, they've been making up stories, they've been designing, they've been um, inventing. And when you look at what it is that they like about those games, particularly the, the games like uh, Roblox and Fortnite, it's being able to customize their character. It's being able to save their progress in the game, being able to customize, customize their avatar in particular, completing challenges, playing as a character. Again, they are playing out their creative and imaginative lives inside these games. And, and if you're not familiar with Roblox uh, in particular, it's not a, a game, it is the YouTube of games. There are tens of millions of games within the Roblox platform. So you can find a game that engages the kind of play that you want to, uh, that you want to, um, take up. So, for example, you can have a, uh, a building game, a design game, a, a social game like Adopt Me where you're uh, raising a, a, char a character. Um, all these things are very similar to what we've seen in the physical world. We can't talk about kids' media lives and their play lives without talking about video as well. Uh, next to the gaming platforms like Roblox and Fortnite and Minecraft, YouTube and TikTok have really risen up in their lives. So are they just watching or are they being creative in these worlds? We've found that a percentage increase from 2020 to 22 of almost 20% of 20, almost 20 among 9 to 12 year olds and 26% among 13 to 15 year olds in using their smartphones to shoot video. So that's great, they're shooting video, but are they doing anything with it? Well, if you look at our statistics for YouTube and for TikTok, they absolutely are. The numbers are going up very fast for how many of them have uploaded video to these platforms to share the things that they are creating with their friends and with, and with the broader world as well. And these are the platforms, as you can see on the top, where they are spending their, their time. Uh, 
They are uh, you know, the, over half of children two to five watching YouTube weekly, over 60% of six to eights, three quarters of nine to fifteens. So this is, this is captivating them in some ways more than the linear television services at this point. So we talk about generation UGC. UGC is uh, user-generated content. And this is a generation right now, Gen Alpha and the tail end of Gen, Gen Z, that has never known a time without touch screen, mobile, digital media. They have grown up with it just being a natural part of their lives and they are using it to become creative builders. I had to use this, this is, this is my niece's um, dream kitchen that she made in Roblox. Um, but when you stop and think about it, it used to be that you would take your Barbie dream home, you would take uh, you know, your crayons, and you would design your, your dream house, your dream, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you wanted to make. Uh, you would decorate it yourself. At age 12, she figured out the tools to build the kitchen of her dreams. And you notice it's got a climbing wall in the background. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a multi-function multi room. I refer to this as the learnification of gaming. You've probably heard about the gamification of learning, the idea of incorporating learning, um, you know, learning uh, into, into curriculum. This is the learnification of gaming. This is the intrinsically motivated drive within a game to build the games, to build the, uh, the concepts that you want to play, that you and your friends want to play. It's teaching yourself to code, it is teaching yourself to edit video, it is all the things that make, that using your creative tools in order to envision the things that you want to share with the world. And you'll see later how that impacts, uh, how that has a broader impact. I wanted to feature three quick stories of, of actual kids who have been using this learnification of gaming to do amazing things. This is Spencer Farber. He's actually the son of a children and media academic researcher, so I uh, know the, the father personally, uh, so not, a, not an urban myth. He built the entire world, the entire village from Encanto, the movie Encanto, in Minecraft. That wasn't enough. He then took his iPad and the video program, and he recreated shot for shot the video for We Don't Talk About Bruno in his Minecraft world. That is intrinsically motivated creation, intrinsically motivated learning how to use those tools to build the things that he wanted to share. Preston Matanga at age 14. This is a quote from the producer of Across the Spider-Verse who also produced the Lego movie too. And he talks about how the Lego movie was inspired by people who were creating Lego films at home. And then they came across Preston, who had been, at age 14, was making Lego videos of Spider-Man. And when they went to make Across the Spider-Verse, they went and commissioned this 14-year-old kid to make a scene for a major Hollywood movie release. And finally, if you haven't read Michael Saman's book, App Kid, it's a really worthwhile read. Michael started making games at age 12. Uh, he, primarily iOS games at the time because he's a little, little bit older. He was the youngest person ever hired by Facebook at 17 to be a programmer. And what's important about what he says here is that it's the intrinsic motivation. He says, if I had ever been bored building, I never could have made the things that I wanted to build. I did it because I loved immersing myself in co coding. I did it because I had a vision of the, something that I wanted to make and share with the world. And if I hadn't had that, it, I never would have gotten anywhere. So I'm going to close with the question, can I go digital? If I'm, if I'm a toy maker, if I'm a game maker, how do I, you know, do, does this world have anything to hold for me, this world of, of this digital world of, of uh, social gaming platforms, of video and so forth? And I think not only does it have something to hold, it has something to hold at every stage across the development cycle for you. If during creative development of a toy or game, 
you can test playable concepts at a lower cost inside a platform like Roblox. Build a small world, build an experience, build a play pattern, and invite, your, invite users of these platforms to come and try it out and see if they engage with it, see if it works for them. You can gain a lot of information very quickly in a live environment. Once you've got something and you want to acquire customers, you can spark their curiosity. We did a small Roblox game for a new television IP that had never been seen before. It was, it was a, based on a book that didn't really sell a lot of books. Um, and and uh, they wanted to, you know, they knew that they were go going uphill trying to get attention from, uh, from people with something that had never been seen. We built a tiny little Roblox world for them. We spent about a thousand UK pounds on promotion for it. And within the first weekend, we had tens of thousands of plays. But better than that, the people who played it, because they'd never seen it before, started making YouTube videos saying, what is this? Where can I find out more about this? So if you can put your brand, your IP, your toys into one of these worlds, you can spark curiosity about it. And they are very low friction environments. With Roblox, if you download the, the uh, app to play, you can play any game. There's not going back to mom and saying, can I download another game? Can I download another game? Can I download another game? Can I have some money to buy another game? Yes, you can spend money inside Roblox. Robux are what kids ask for more than anything else in their allowance right now and in their, their holiday gifts. But um, in terms of just play, it's an open world for playing. Audience retention, you can mirror the, the world that you've created around your toy inside a Roblox game. So you can mirror the play pattern, just as we've talked about how the play patterns transfer well, the classic play patterns transfer well from the physical world to the digital world. You can manage your own brand in these worlds. You can continually update the game to, to reflect your, how you are changing your brand, to reflect um, how kids are playing with it, to emphasize certain parts of the game if you find that some are really popular and some are not. And you gain immediate insight into how, kid, how fans want to play. Think about this in the YouTube world as well. The current development cycle for a major animated series is about two to four years, maybe three to five years. The development cycle for YouTube wake up in the morning, figure out what you want to do, put it up by noon, have the analytics by the end of the day. You get instant insight. And then something we call fanatomy, the anatomy of a fan. How you take a casual fan and deepen their engagement with your brand, or how you take a deep fan and get them to be your best advocates. These are the platforms that kids share on the playground now that they're back on the playground together with their friends. These are the brands that, or these are the, the platforms where they gather in the afternoon and meet up in a game. So you can really use those, the people who love your, your content, your product, your toy, in order to, um, uh, in order to deepen their, their relationship with it. And you can give away merchandise as well. You can, you can have your logo on a shirt inside these, these uh, gaming platforms. You can have a branded world. So kids can express their fandom in what they wear. And believe me, their avatars right now are where they're spending their money to reflect their, their personality. And then finally, uh, for revenue. It's a more difficult question, but I will note that just recently, Fortnite said that it would be offering 100% of, of all revenue inside a game for the first six months if you commit to being exclusive on their platform. That's me. That's how to contact me. Again, if you give me a card over here, I am more than happy to, uh, to send you the deck. I am uh, happy to introduce you to our games team, happy to introduce you to our research team. Thank you very much for the opportunity.